All right, folks, I'm giving people just another few seconds to possibly stream in before getting started. All right, I think it's a good time to start. So welcome to the sixth lecture in the 2021-22 uh, iteration of Dalhousie's Health Law and Policy Seminar Series. I'm Sheila Wildman. I'm a faculty member uh, of the Health Law Institute. Our associate director, Adelina Ittene, has done a terrific job of pulling together this year's challenging, <clears throat> timely roster of imaginative, tough-minded, uh, critical speakers. And today's session is a real highlight for me and uh, us all. Our speaker today is Professor Marina Morrow, who is chair of the School of Health Policy and Management at York University. Professor Morrow works and writes in the area of critical health policy with a focus on mental health reforms, neoliberalism, and intersectional and social justice approaches in mental health. She is lead editor of the important 2017 volume, Critical Inquiries for Social Justice in Mental Health. <clears throat> Methodologically, Marina is a leader in the area of community engaged research, having established groundbreaking, groundbreaking collaborative research partnerships with community based organizations, healthcare practitioners, advocates, and policymakers. One example of which uh, we'll have a chance to hear a little more about today. A couple of technical things before I turn it over to Professor Morrow. The session is being video recorded and will be available on the law school's YouTube channel. Closed captioning is available and you can find a link to this in the chat if you want to turn it on. And last, please use the Q&A box. You see a, a link to it or a click click button for it at the bottom of your screen. Use that if you have questions that you want to type in and you can do that at any time during the lecture. They won't be popping up and disturbing uh, the lecturer. <clears throat> and I'll be able to draw on those at the end of the session. And in fact, you can even upvote questions that you see in that text box that you wanna be prioritized uh, as you listen to the lecture if you like. Uh, Professor Morrow will talk for 30 to 40 minutes followed by time for your questions and discussion. And we have to wind up by 1.20. All right, so that's it for me. Over to you, Professor Morrow. Great, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. And I also wanna thank the organizers, Adelina and Ashley and, and Pamela, our captioner. Um, I'm very excited to have been invited to participate in this speaker series at the Dalhousie Health Law Institute. Uh, most of you will probably not be aware, but the Institute has always held a little place in my heart because many years ago in its early inception, as a PhD student, I worked with the Institute on a large uh, research project related to elder abuse. And at that time, it was really a wonderfully, uh, wonderful sort of mentoring experience for me at that point in my career. So I'm really sorry that we can't be there all together in person so I could meet you, um, but I'm really looking forward to this um, virtual engagement. So I'm going to just share my screen. You can see my slides. There we go. Um, so I'm going to be presenting today on a SHRC funded project related to mental health and social justice. Um, this project is a four year venture and I'm going to be presenting preliminary results just from phase one of the research. You can keep up with the project at the, with the URL that's on the front of the slide. Uh, we're just in the process of developing our website so it won't be active probably until the end of March, but um, stay tuned. So I just want to start by saying that I'm coming to you from the area known as to Toronto, uh, otherwise known as Toronto, which is on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. I want to honour and respect the many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples that inhabit this land. So before we start, I also want to um, just sort of acknowledge um, the research team. This is a very large uh, project, international, uh, with a lot of different uh, players. It's a multi-site project taking place in Canada, Kenya, and Australia. And in each location, we have an academic uh, partner partnering with a community-based organization that represents disability rights activism. 
in each location. And of course, we also have many um, very involved uh, and engaged research assistants, some of which you can see on this slide. The project is also um, overseen in part by an, a large knowledge user group, which is um, an international collection of people who represent people with lived experiences of mental distress and disability human rights organizations. And the role of the knowledge user group has really been to help oversee various activities of the project and really to um, assist us with the knowledge exchange. And to, we're, we're hoping that over time, it will become kind of a network and a place um, for people to share ideas that have similar interests in this area. So we have, as you can see, we have membership from uh, places like the International Disability Alliance, the World Health Organization, Peer Zone, and, and a number of others. So in my presentation today, I'm gonna to start with just a little bit of background, sort of how did I, you know, how did the team come together? What are some of the issues we wanted to address in the research? Um, I wanna talk a bit about how we work. So centering intersectional values, how we work as a team and what our, what our process is. And then I'm going to talk about the methodology and present um, to you some of our preliminary results uh, with an opportunity to, to discuss the implications. And I'm really looking forward to uh, having some engagement with all of you around that piece. So in terms of the, the rationale, the impetus for this project really came out of the recognition, and this has come from you know, many years of my own community-based research, um, that despite the promises of deinstitutionalization and recovery models, uh, where you know, we thought we were moving towards a more humane form of mental health care in line with human rights, in fact, coercive practices and human rights violations in mental health care continue. Here I'm speaking about things like involuntary detainment and treatment, the use of restraints and seclusion, but I'm also talking about other kinds of coercive practices which um, relate to, discrimin to discrimination. We know that stigma, discrimination, and human rights violations are experienced by many people accessing mental health care, and yet system response to this evidence has been poor. Indeed, many countries' domestic mental health laws have been found to, in, to contravene international human rights covenants like the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And this is true um, in the Canadian, Australian, and Kenyan context. Stigmatizing attitudes, discriminatory practices, and involuntary detainment and treatment mechanisms, we know that those all undermine people's self-determination and their human rights. Uh, another thing that we know, of course, is that racialized and indigenous populations are disproportionately impacted by mental health uh, human rights violations. These practices, as I said, exist despite the fact that we've moved towards recovery-oriented paradigms in mental health. And internationally, we can, when we look internationally, we can see that non-governmental organizations and um, persons with disability organizations that are user-led, that is led by people themselves that have experience of the mental health care system, have really played a key advocacy role. And we do have some excellent models for recovery-oriented, non-coercive, community-based mental health care. So it's not like we don't have the models out there, but we're not always um, implementing them or following them. So then, so really then the overarching aim of this research is to investigate service user experiences of coercive practices and the role of recovery oriented service user involved organizations in advancing equity and aligning mental health services, both with the UN's convention on the rights of persons with disabilities, their human rights framework, and with the WHO, the World Health Organization's mental health quality rights initiative, which is a, which is a toolkit that can be used um, in mental health to ensure organizations are complying with, with uh, human rights. So this slide just gives a couple of examples of the ways in which coercive practices are disproportionately experienced by um, certain populations. So the first is just sort of to say that men who are racialized immigrant and, uh, sorry, racialized migrant and indigenous are more likely to be involuntarily detained and subject to coercive practices. And the practice of electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, um, which has been proven in many instances to be damaging to the brain is used more frequently on older women. So we can begin to see here kind of how intersections impact in this area. So the, the research itself has six objectives, um, four of which I'm gonna to touch on today, but just so you have a sense of the overall kind of um, scope of the project. 
Um, and you'll see the, the ones that are in red are the ones that we're gonna to touch on today. So the first part of our project has been to synthesize the current evidence base on the use of involuntary de uh, detainment and treatment and other coercive practices. And we're doing this through something called a critical realist synthesis, re synthesis review, which I'll describe to you. Um, and we're really trying to identify barriers and facilitators of equity um, in that review. Secondly, we're identifying the contextual influences on mental health policies, where we're focusing on underlying values and assumptions, which promote or undermine the uptake of equity and human rights as a policy priority. And we're doing this through a critical discourse analysis of policy. Uh, in, in phase two of the project, we're, not, we're just getting there now, and you won't, unfortunately, I don't have the results yet for this piece, but we're going to be documenting a diverse range of service users' experiences with involuntary detainment um, and other coercive practices. And we'll be doing that at all of the um, different research sites, uh, mostly, in, mostly in the urban context, but possibly some rural areas in Kenya as well. Fourth, we are um, identifying recovery-oriented service user-led and involved organizations that provide community-based mental health care services, supports, resources, and advocacy that exemplify equity and respect for human rights. So we didn't want this project just to stay at the level of critique. We wanted it to also be able to foreground and, um, I guess, bring forward into the evidence base some of these really amazing um, practices that are going on and that are uh, really respecting the principles of equity and human rights. So we're going to do this through case studies and rapid ethnography. And you'll see in the discussion of the results today that we've started this process. And then, of course, resulting from all of the research and data that we've collected and a synthesis of that, our aim is to develop a framework for equity and human rights that enhance community-based mental health care. And then number six, what, something that we've been doing all along the way is to develop and engage in an integrated knowledge translation strategy. And this strategy is meant to uh, build capacity, research capacity among students and, and community-based researchers and interactively share the results of the research with a range of relevant audiences um, to ensure that it's not something that just um, sits in a report on, on a shelf. So before we talk about the methodology and the preliminary results of the study, I really wanted to give you a little bit of a window into our collaborative and intersectional approach to the research. So intersectionality as a theoretical framework or a paradigm is something that we're very much adopting in our work. And intersectionality, if you're not familiar with it, understands oppressions as, or you know, inequities as overlapping and interconnected. And what it urges researchers to do is to look at what those intersections can tell us about power and how power operates in, in the systems that we're examining. But it also requires researchers not just to be outwardly focused, but to also be inwardly focused and reflexive in their practice. So as a team, we take the use of intersectionality to mean that we need to interact, that we need to actually enact intersectional values in our practice and process. So we've been doing that in a number of different ways. So we've done um, together with our knowledge user group, which we affectionately refer to as the CUG, our knowledge user group, the research team and the research assistants um, have, have connected with each other virtually and done uh, a values-based kind of exercise where we established um, values together that we felt would both guide our own interactions in the project, but also would guide um, how we evaluated some of the evidence that we're looking at. And some of those things include things like the valuing of lived experience. Um, so both in terms of representation and, and so throughout our team, we have people who identify with lived experience of, of mental distress and, and experiences within the mental health care system, including coercive practices. So we have representation, but we also have a real commitment to um, what we describe as the epistemological significance of lived experience. So here is what I mean is that lived experience or centering voices that are on the margins can really better help us better understand oppression and understand um, some of the inequities and how they're operating in the mental health care system. Another sort of value commitment we had was um, something that we sort of loosely describe as capacity building, but it's really about um, recognizing that people bring different um, strengths, they bring different um, contexts, different backgrounds to the, con to the context of the project, and we want to build on that together. We all bring a, a strong commitment to human rights and social justice and an understanding of mental health as embedded in a, in a context, uh, a broader social 
context. And so those are some of just some of the values that um, that guide the project and, and guide our uh, working together. Of course, this work is not without its challenges. It's an international project with uh, three uh, sites that have some commonalities, but also some very distinct differences. Um, each of the sites are similar in that we have ongoing legacies of colonization, and those are central um, to our analysis. But of course, that colonization has played out differently in the in the different communities that we're engaging with. How we talk about um, disenfranchised uh, groups also really differs across the sites. And so we've had a lot of lively discussion about language. And so you'll see a couple of acronyms up there, some of which you might be familiar with. The acronym CALD is used in the, in the Australian context. It means culturally and linguistically diverse peoples. Um, and it really references, and it's used, it's used, it's important because it's used to gather statistics in the, in the Australian context, but it references mostly people for whom English is not a first language and uh, new immigrants. Um, and it just, so it doesn't really capture uh, racialization, for example. Of course, in Canada, the term BIPOC, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color has become uh, more popular. Um, but of course, what we've discovered in working across these sites is that black is used in a very different way across the sites. So just as an example, in Australia, many indigenous groups uh, claim, claim the label of, of black. Uh, so these are just some of the, the challenges that we're, they're working with, we're, that we're working with. Of course, um, you might be asking why these three countries? Why, why did you choose these? Well, what's interesting in terms of what unites these countries is they're all common law countries with the same legislative framework. So we all are subject to the Mental Health Act, um, but we have different uh, mental health care systems. So of course, uh, Canada has a publicly funded system. Australia and Kenya have a mix of public and private. And then important to note uh, that Kenya um, does not really have a community-based mental health infrastructure. So their, their care is still very much um, institutional and hospital-based. Just finally, a couple of other little challenges I wanted to mention. The pandemic, all of us are, are still amidst this um, incredibly challenging time. And of course, for research where you want to be connecting on the ground and engaging with people, uh, that's been a real constraint for us. It's why we've pushed the field research uh, forward a bit, hoping that we can still do some of that work in, in person. Um, certainly, we've had a lot of conversations as a team as the pandemic was unfolding, how it was affecting us, um, our Kenyan partners, we're very slow to get access to the vaccine, as an example. Um, they've struggled a lot with internet access. Um, they, they often have blackouts um, of the internet. So, um, you know, recognizing that not all, not all of the team members are working with the same amount of um, resources um, in this context. And I did also want to just say a few words about mental health challenges. As a team, um, given that we have representation across our team of folks with lived experience, we work as a team to accommodate those challenges. We understand that, that it's likely to happen. Um, and in fact, it has. Some of us have, have gone through periods of unwellness. And so as a team, we strive to create, create an open space for people to take time away as needed and then to re-enter uh, when they're well. And we have a little bit of a plan in place to ensure that the work um, goes forward regardless. So those are just some uh, things to kind of uh, get us centered, get you, give you a window, I guess, into how we're working together with this large team. Um, and in some ways, I would say that, that Zoom technology has been very helpful for that because we have been able to connect um, more regularly than we would be in other times, I suppose. Um, but of course, the disadvantage is that we haven't been able to physically be together at any of the sites yet, as of yet. In addition to intersectionality, there's a couple of other key concepts that are really important in our work. Um, so I just wanna share these with you. So the, the first is, um, uh, well, I guess maybe just before I, before I say that, I wanna say that these concepts, the reason they're so integral, um, they're, they're in some ways, quote unquote, the air we breathe in. So they're, they've become so naturalized, we almost don't even recognize them. So uh, these two, two concepts are neoliberalism and biomedicalism. So neoliberalism, much has been written about it. It's really a set of practices that are centered on the increased role for the free market. Um, and it can also be understood as a form of governmentality in Foucault's terms, um, which means that we can see neoliberalism operating in discursive practices. So that's in the operation of language. And in the case of our work in policy discourses that influence our understanding of the social world. And people have talked about neoliberalism as creating new identities, the shift from sort of collective forms of identity 
to more individualized ideas about what constitutes subject formation. So when you think about this in the context of policy, it promotes individualistic understandings of complex social problems, and it really urges people to take responsibility for their own mental health. So this notion of responsabilization. And then we also have seen the increased use of market mechanisms in health and mental health care delivery, sometimes referred to as managerialism and welfare state retrenchment, that is cutbacks in favor of self-reliance and volunteerism. Nicholas Rose has talked about biological psychiatry as a style of thought. And that is, it's so normalized as the dominant discourse that it becomes a routine way of thinking about mental health and mental illness. Even though we know on the ground and in certainly in many conversations, people talk about the social determinants of mental health, biomedicalism still tends to really dominate. Uh, our treatment systems. And in our work, we understand biomedicalism and neoliberalism to mutually reinforce each other. And they mutually reinforce each other with respect to individualistic understandings of social problems. And they also have the effect of blunting the scholarship and activism that point to complex um, interactions between the biological and the social. So although our research is very much focused on um, the social side of this discussion. Uh, none of us want to throw out the biological side. We understand it to play an important role, but we see the system as really imbalanced with respect to the focus, which is why our work is focused more on the social side. So today I'm going to um, talk about the methodology and then the pre preliminary results for phase one, which is the critical realist review, the environmental scan, and the intersectional based policy analysis. And you'll see there are several other phases of the project that um, are coming up and ongoing. So with respect to the methodology, um, we chose a critical realist review, which is a literature-based methodological approach um, to critical analysis, which allows re researchers to understand social interventions by examining the underlying social, cultural, and political context of an issue. So when you do this kind of um, uh, literature review, you're asking what works for whom, in what circumstances, and in what respects. Now, critical realist reviews differ from realist reviews in that they're a review of the literature. They're not really an empirical review of interventions. Um, realist reviewers, for example, avoid making normative claims, while critical realist reviewers are concerned with the broader macrosocial um, structural context in which interventions are embedded. So when you conduct a realist review, a critical realist review, um, Edgeley suggests, and I'll just read this quote, that students and researchers be encouraged to use theories and explore ideas which embody notions of social justice or critique of underlying assumptions about social and health organizations. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a window into what that kind of literature review looks like. Alongside of this, we've also engaged in an environmental scan. And we used, the way we did this in part was we took the expertise of our research team and our knowledge user group, and we did these online workshops using a really interesting online platform called Miro, Miro Boards. I don't know if anybody's familiar with them, but they're kind of like having you know, a conference room with a whiteboard that people can you know, um, write on and contribute ideas to. Um, so we use that for people to be able to, uh, you know, we had generated as a team values that would guide the project and values that we thought should guide system responses. And we used as, a, as our starting point and got people to kind of then brainstorm about organizations or practices that they felt fit those values. And then we also engaged um, with a uh, gray literature scan. So that is uh, to say, looking at websites, looking at uh, reports from organizations, uh, to find and surface organizations and practices in line with equity and human rights and mental health. And then finally, we used an intersectional based policy analysis. So, um, of course, intersectionality is known to people from the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, who coined that term back in the late 80s um, as a critical race um, theorist in the US. And, and we know, of course, that though the sort of the ideas behind intersectionality really come from the second wave of, of the feminist movement from Black, Indigenous, Latina, post-colonial and queer scholars, all of whom were producing work that was trying to understand how complex um, factors and processes um, shape human lives. And so drawing on that, we're using a tool called intersectional based policy analysis, which brings that theoretical and activist framework to analyzing uh, policy. So it surfaces underlying values and assumptions. So with the um, critical realist review, 
So one of the portions of that method is that you start with candidate theories. And they, these are um, tied again to the values that we generated with the knowledge user group. And we tested these five candidate theories to see whether or not there were evidence of them in the literature and how they were spoken about. So just to tell you briefly about each of them. So one uh, theory is this notion that and we use many terms because these different terms appear in the literature. So user-led, peer-led, consumer-led, or site survivor-led initiatives are going to be more likely to promote equity and human rights. That's a, a theory that we were working with. Um, that an understanding and operate and being able to operationalize uh, social and destructural, structural determinants of health, mental health will promote equity and human rights. Um, that the values underlying a system of delivery play a key role in promoting or undermining equitable practices. So part of what our research has been, um, certainly our policy analysis has been to surface what are those underlying values and assumptions that are guiding system response today. Um, emphasizing the importance of community-led initiatives and uh, that explore individual and system change and explicitly attend to power in their operations. So again, um, we theorize that that will result in more equitable responses. And then initiatives that address the historical and ongoing impact of colonization are more likely to promote equity and human rights. So to do this um, critical realist review, we did it in partnership um, with one of our uh, Canadian um, organizations, Evians, which is the Center for um, Study on Disability Rights. It's a cross disability um, organization, human rights organization. And in the context of that search, we searched 25 databases, we identified um, 51 articles. And as I mentioned, we also did these three workshops with our international um, knowledge user group um, to kind of supplement the material. We found that in the literature, we could only get so far without um, going to the gray literature and to the expertise of our, our knowledge users. For our intersectional based policy analysis, what we did is we applied and there's if you're interested, um, you can look up the intersectional based policy analysis framework and guideline it's it's easily accessible online. Um, it uses the principles of intersectionality and, and applies it to policy analysis through a series of questions. So the questions are things like, how is the problem being represented? How is the problem um, in its representation? How is it impacting um, different populations in, in specific kinds of ways? Uh, what are some of the values and beliefs that you bring to the policy analysis arena? So it, it gets you into kind of reflexive questions um, as a way of analyzing uh, policy. And it draws on an Australian um, academic, uh, Carol Bakke's work, who uses kind of a post-structuralist lens and a, and, a, and a method called what's the problem represented to be. It draws on that, um, methodology, but brings more of a social justice orientation or focus. So we applied that form of analysis to key policy documents, domestic uh, policy documents in Canada, uh, Australia, and Kenya. And in Canada, we had two sites, BC and Ontario. And in BC, we were able to look at both um, the, the general sort of provincial mental health strategy governing uh, mental health uh, provision, service provision, uh, as well as um, policies and strategies emerging directly from their First Nations health, author health Authority. So you know that in BC, it's the only province in Canada that has a First Nations Health Authority. So we were able to actually look at documents that are coming out of First Nations communities themselves. In Ontario, we were looking just again at, at sort of domestic um, health policy. The roadmap to wellness um, was one of the documents, for example, that we looked at there. In Kenya, um, they have only a national mental health strategy. So it's not, um, it's not done regionally. Their strategies are not regionalized. They're not decentralized in the same way as Canada and Australia. So we looked at um, specifically their, their Kenyan mental health policy and some of the accompanying um, documents, including um, a task force report. And in Australia, in Melbourne, um, what was really interesting when we started the work um, this was just beginning, they had, they, they had established a Royal Commission uh, in the state of Victoria to examine mental health. And so uh, we were able to actually look at um, the results of that commission and analyze that alongside of some of the other uh, documents, uh, sort of domestic Melbourne uh, mental health strategies. So we chose all of these documents based on how recent they were and how influential we felt they were in, in guiding uh, policy and practice. 
And we used, as I said, the principles of intersectionality in our analysis. So things like understanding categories of oppression as intersecting, um, understanding uh, the, the, the benefits of diverse knowledges. So certainly in the context of BC, we were able to do that in, in more specific ways because we had um, documents from First Nations communities themselves. So we use those um, to, to guide our analysis. The environmental scan I've already kind of described to you, but it really came from a number of different sources, the Miro exercises, so the Miro board exercises online, um, as well as the critical realist review, and then just conversations with the research team and, and review of the, of the uh, gray literature. And then what came from that is we were able then to shortlist organizations that we compiled for deeper analysis based on, we kind of used a three-star kind of rating. Um, and that, that criteria was really the candidate theories that you saw earlier outlined in the critical realist review. Those guided whether or not we rated an organization or a practice as um, three stars, two stars, or, or one star. Um, after we, we kind of uh, compiled the three star resources, we did a much more deeper dive into each of those organizations um, through the internet, uh, through publicly available material and took reflexive notes and, and, and um, you know, provided commentary about the details of the organization and how they actually um, meet those candidate theories. And we, we've done that in a very systematic way because you'll see in a lot of part of the research, we want to actually do case studies. And so we will draw our case studies of organizations um, that are enacting human rights and social justice um, practices we'll draw that from this, um, this environmental scan and, and then we'll actually do uh, rapid ethnography and case studies with some of those organizations. So a, a total of 34 resources were identified as aligning with those um, candidate theories. And this, this environmental scan um, will stand on its own, I think is a really good resource. And it's kind of interesting, it, it um, aligns nicely with a recent document that came out from the World Health Organization called Guidance on Community Mental Health Resources. And our partner at the World Health Organization, um, that, that document was being developed at the same time as our research. So we actually had an opportunity to, to have input into it and it's now been publicly released so people can, can take a look at it. So I'm gonna start and tell you a little bit about some of the key themes that emerged from each of these um, preliminary findings. So from the realist, uh, critical realist review and, and anybody who's you know, done these literature reviews um, you know how daunting it can be. There's so many online resources these days and, and so many different databases. And so we worked pretty closely with uh, librarians and folks who could help to guide us on this piece. Um, and these are just some of the, the themes that have emerged. So it was interesting to us that very few peer reviewed academic articles spoke directly to equity and human rights. Yes, there was a lot of material on, on legislation and law and legal uh, kinds of arguments, but um, not a whole lot of stuff that really was looking at in the comprehensive kind of way that we're thinking about equity and human rights. But in line with one of our candidate um, theories, uh, peer consumer psychiatric survivor led initiatives were discussed as more likely to promote equity and human rights. Um, and mental health care was described interestingly as, as transitioning from a system driven kind of system to a user driven um, perspective. So a recognition that we've moved from a time period where we didn't think very much about people's own experiences of the system or engage people with those experiences or engage peer support workers, for example, that now we're very much um, doing that work. And there was lots and lots of literature on, on peer support and peer workers and, and kind of their, the barriers, the challenges, the struggles there. Another theme that emerged from the uh, Realist Review was that collaborative knowledge production that emphasizes shared power is something that is seen as enhancing equity. So shared power here between people with lived experience, whether that's people themselves or family members and carers and, and people working in the system, that, that collaborative kind of knowledge production is really important. Uh, there was also lots of literature talking about holistic and person-centered approaches to mental health. So we, many of you will be familiar with this, lots of conversations about how um, there's not such a thing as a one size fits all kind of approach to mental health that, that people need, people's um, individual circumstances, as well as their broader social context um, really need to be taken into account. And then interestingly, um, quite a lot of literature on spirituality as an integral element in mental health approaches um, emerged in our review. 
With respect to the policy analysis, um, we have some very interesting kind of uh, themes that have emerged and I wanna give you kind of some examples of each of these. So the first is that colonialism and psychiatry are deeply interconnected. Um, so for example, in the Kenyan context, one of our investigators, uh, Mohammed Ibrahim, he's been tracing historically the ways in which psychiatry and psychiatrists um, were very much key players in the, in the colonial um, pro project, very much like in the Canadian context where uh, you know, the field of medicine, hospitals, and, and also I would argue psychiatry uh, played a role in that early um, formation of colonialism. And in the Kenyan context, as in the Canadian and Australian context, what this has meant is the suppression of local knowledge and traditions um, and how this has, and what we were able to see in the, in the current um, national Kenyan mental health um, documents is that that, that that same kind of perspective um, continues today. So that there's very much been an adoption of Western biomedical um, understandings of mental health over and above um, uh, traditional knowledges. Uh, for example. And, and what makes that even more interesting in the Kenyan context is that most people in the Kenyan context still get their mental health care supports either through spiritual leaders or through, or through traditional healing practices. So you have a policy document that barely mentions these things and really is based on the sort of biomedical Western framework, um, while at the same time, you know your population is actually um, mostly accessing uh, services and supports that you're not really even acknowledging at the policy level. Um, in the BC context, I mentioned this before that we have uh, mental health strategies that are actually emerging directly from indigenous communities through the First Nations Health Authority um, that are kind of interestingly kind of placed alongside of, of the more Western uh, traditional uh, mental health documents. So lots of really interesting uh, pieces there that we're pulling together and, and trying to understand in, uh, with respect to colonization. Another key theme, of course, that's emerged <clears throat> that won't be surprising is the dominance of uh, biomedicalism. A couple, I've given some examples already, but a couple of um, interesting examples. So you'll see in these strategies, it's always fascinating to me, there'll be conversations about social determinants of mental health. So lots of acknowledgement that housing is important, that in income security is important, um, that social support is important. Um, sometimes there's acknowledgement that People have experiences of, of racism or sexism or heterosexism um, in there, and that, <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> excuse me, that that impacts mental health. But inevitably, in these policy documents, there's a default back to the biomedical. So social things are seen as kind of there and playing a role, but not intricately connected to mental health. And so what I mean by that is that there's not really an understanding that people are socially embedded, right? That they're embedded in social, political, economic contexts that can't really be pulled apart from their mental health. And, and so not, um, none of the policy documents that we re reviewed really, um, you, you know, were able to really uh, frame mental health in that, in that particular kind of social and structural way that we were looking for. Um, neoliberalism, um, good example would be in Ontario uh, where a lot of focus, and this is true in a lot of Canadian mental health policies today um, and strategies, you'll see a lot of focus on coordination of the system, integration of the system, lots of conversations about lack of resources. So a lot of focus on the sort of technocratic aspects of the system without much reference to quality of care. And in many of the Canadian documents, any kind of discussion about human rights was completely absent, as though those violations don't exist, as though we don't aren't governed by mental health acts. Um, and so in, in the Ontario context, another kind of striking thing in the strategy here in Ontario was a real focus on trying to get people back to work. So, you know, how can we quickly get people well and get them back into the workforce? Um, and of course that doesn't recognize that for many people that may not be um, a reality. Uh, however, there's some really promising things happening at, at the local level in Toronto. Um, we captured uh, through municipal policy uh, following the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the city is actually piloting non-crisis, or sorry, non-police um, crisis response um, to mental health. And so we've got um, some funded, municipally funded um, pilot projects that are taking place in the city of Toronto. So we were able to bring that into our analysis as well. Um, with respect to human rights, it's really interesting. So I mentioned in the Canadian context, pretty much absent. 
However, it's very much foregrounded in the Kenyan context where there's a lot of reference to the UN uh, Convention on the Rights for People with Disabilities. Um, and in the Australian context, particularly in the Royal Commission, lots of conversation about um, the broader human rights context. But again, what's striking, striking in each of those um, contexts is that the mechanisms uh, for attaining human rights are not really articulated. And in both cases, um, they continue to uphold domestic mental health laws, which are in contravention of, of the UN Declaration. So suffice to say that intersectional values and frameworks were not typically used to understand mental health and the structural determinants of mental health in our, in our policy analysis. So what do we kind of take away um, from, from this? Um, these are just three kind of areas and it'd be interesting to, to have a kind of a, a further conversation um, with each of you around this piece. So some of the takeaways are uh, disrupting biomedical re reductionism, protecting human rights and mental health and enhancing equity. And so that, what, what, what will we require in order to ensure that these things happen? Well, we have to adopt values and principles that uphold human rights and equity. Um, and that has to be done by governments, by policymakers and service providers. We also have to support the leadership of people with lived experience at policy development tables and in service delivery. There's certainly lots of um, engagement of people with lived experience now in the policy arena in the Canadian context and internationally, but sometimes this is still very tokenistic um, and or not really led by um, service users. Um, we will need to adopt intersectional and decolonizing approaches in mental health, given the intersecting and overlapping forms of oppression that flow from inequities of power throughout society. So we really think it's important to use intersectional and decolonizing lenses um, and apply those to, to policy and practice. And the intersectional based policy analysis framework is, is one that's out there and, and is actually being used by policymakers now, especially in the international context, um, showing that it is possible to do this. Um, embrace reflexivity as a key component of research policy and practice. So it's something that we are, I'm not going to say we're doing it perfectly on our team, but we're striving to do it, we're trying to do it, and we hope to be able to write about it in terms of how it might um, impact um, how we were able to work together and, and, and impact the research that we're doing. And then ultimately, I suppose we're calling for uh, transformative change. So just, in, just as my last kind of um, slide here, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about our next steps um, so that you can, see, you, know, you can see that the project is ongoing. So we're just starting into phase two, the field research, and I'm excited to announce that we just, um, we're just in the process and of finalizing hiring peer researchers um, to work with us um, from all of the sites to work collaboratively with us to develop um, the field research instruments to help us think through who should we talk to, um, who should we bring together in focus groups, how do we capture some of the inequities that we know exist out there. So we're gonna be doing key informant interviews with people um, in the system who work in the system, as well as uh, focus groups with people with lived experience. Um, the case studies I mentioned, those will not happen now, probably now for another year. And, and that's where we're actually gonna do, uh, use the environmental scan to, to um, select some organizations that we can actually study in more depth, do some case studies on them. And, and part of the goal, and this comes from my own experience of, of um, looking at the literature and community-based mental health care, there's lots of um, evaluations of uh, programs such as assertive community treatment um, programs, very little in the literature that looks at what's, you know, some of these promising practices, very little evaluation, very little documentation. And so the case studies are a way for us to begin to bring some of this knowledge that we know is out there um, into the academic literature so that it can in fact be taken into account um, more seriously in policymaking. And then of course ongoing in our project is really knowledge integration and, and mobilization. And so we've had, um, we're having some really interesting and fun discussions with the knowledge user group right now about um, developing a series of webinars. So one of one idea that we have that's you know still to be fleshed out is that you know how do we bring some of what we're learning in this project uh, to people who are accessing mental health care? How do we you know step out of sort of the more academic uh, language that we're using and distill some of our work um, into a context so that people can can take it up and use it 
um, in their own uh, work environment. So thinking about practitioners here as well as uh, people with lived experiences. So those are, those are our next steps. Uh, we've got another um, two years and um, we're excited. Oh, I guess I should just say um, one other quick thing and that is the website is under development. And as I mentioned, uh, one way to follow um, us would be to look at the website. We're gonna have a, a electronic newsletter, very short newsletter um, that you can sign up for that will give you kind of you know, probably quarterly updates on the project. So that website should become live um, towards the end of uh, March. So thank you. I'm uh, looking forward to any kind of questions or discussion you can have. Thank you so much, Marina. That was uh, just a fabulous presentation and gives us so much to think about. Um, and I'm sure there are many questions on many folks' minds. I have my own, but I'm going to start with a question that came up in the text box. And I suppose, you know, just to kind of frame it in a more general, um, well, in a more uh, more general light. Uh, I take this question to uh, kind of instantiate the contested nature of knowledge uh, and of experience based um, claims in the realm of mental health and mental health recovery. So the question relates to ECT specifically, and I think it came up at a point where you had given this as and part of the example of resistance to biomedical approaches to um, mental health. And uh, the question asks, I'm wondering if there's been further consideration of recent very strong evidence supporting both safety and effectiveness of ECT. Uh, the person adds, as an active practitioner, I'm discouraged by the ongoing stigmatization of ECT. Uh, evidence from 2000 is outdated for this uh, 70 plus year old practice, they say, uh, use in an older population with depression, with or without psychotic features. Uh, with vegetative symptoms has been demonstrated as very safe and highly effective. The most effective actually, the approach is much more humane compared to past popular media depictions. Patients, if untreated, often are at risk of severe mal malnutrition, frailty and death, uh, with women living longer, higher rates of depression versus men at older age. The use represents current evidence-based practice. Unfortunately, in the USA, we often see lower privilege and lower uh, SES, social economic uh, groups, having limited access to this treatment. I wonder if this could be the lens to look at ECT through uh, an equity values uh, approach. So that's my long, uh, just articulating, I wanted to just say the question and uh, open it up to you for response. Great, thanks Thanks for that question. And, and um, you know, certainly this is not an, a, an area that I've done a lot of deep research into. And I, I like, Sheila, how you kind of framed it as, you know, potentially um, a little bit of um, you know, when we think about how knowledge production and how um, certain kinds of evidence enters its way into, uh, you know, academic journals, into society, and how that then starts to guide our policy analysis. So partly, or sorry, our policy um, frameworks. So I think what's interesting is that, um, you know, you've got, you do definitely have literature that suggests that ECT is, is effective um, from the perspective of, of the scientists who've studied it. But you also have lots of literature, some of which is not, you know, really apparent in the academic literature, but is more in what I would call the gray literature, sort of accounts from people who've had um, ECT and how that has, has impaired their memory and affected um, their, their brains in a, in a variety of ways. And so you have these kind of almost two conflicting modes of, of evidence, I guess, around ECT, which I think makes it a really complex terrain and a very um, difficult practice to fully stand behind when you've got kind of uh, conflicting forms of evidence. Um, at the same time, you know, I would agree with you, it's, it's kind of, it's certainly one, um, I guess, uh, you know, practice or treatment that's been very much demonized and, you know, misrepresented, um, you know, particularly in the media or, or popular culture, et cetera. And we know how it's practiced today, you know, it's very, it's very different than it was practiced, um, you know, historically. So, you know, those are some of the things I guess I would offer up. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if there's an equitable way to do ECT. I think it's very distressing that, it, that we do see it um, disproportionately used on certain populations and that those who have spoken out against ECT and raised concerns about it have often been, um, their, their you know, dialogue has often been closed down. And so, but, but I think, you know, in the spirit of, of communication, I think it's really important to have these conversations. And that's maybe where the equity piece could start is, is being able to bring people together that might have divergent views 
um, around ECT uh, in a safe way to tables to have conversations about ways to, um, to actually talk about it that, that might um, result in some of the equity um, pieces you're suggesting. So thank you for that. Thank you, thanks for that response. Uh, the next question, reflects in part on federalism, on the federalist you know, reality in, in Canada. This would also be true in Australia. And so the writer says, mental health legislation is diverse even across Canada. For example, BC is one of the most regressive even compared to Ontario. Uh, it may be helpful to have a nuanced approach per jurisdiction using universal principles of human rights and social justice. And so I might just put that to you as a question about how, how you have navigated the reality of, of federalism within jurisdictions. I think this person originally commented when you said these are all nations that have inherited you know, a mental health act model. I take it yeah. you know, the British mental health act model, but of course some of them are federal jurisdictions. And so in fact, there are diverse expressions of that across nations. So how, how have you uh, integrated that fact into your work? Yeah, thank you very much for that for that question. It's very, I mean, it's it's integral to our work. And so, in the Canadian context, and you're right to point out that BC has one of the most, um, I think, the most <laughs> regressive um, mental health acts. So, so mental health acts in Canada are provincial, right? So each province has its own mental health act. There are some common features. So under each, you know, across all provinces and territories, um, you know, there is the, the 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 mental health allows people to be detained involuntarily, for, usually for similar kinds of reasons. So what, what, if they're considered to be a, a, of harm to themselves or to others, or if they're seen as rapidly um, deteriorate, you know, their mental health is rapidly deteriorating. Um, but, what change, what, but what is different across provinces is partly the process, um, the degree to which rights are respected. Um, you know, so there's a number of different features that, that are really important. And so when you compare say BC and Ontario, so in BC, they have something called deemed consent. So if you're taken in under the Mental Health Act, um, you are immediately seen to be um, consenting to treatment. So there's not a separate process to consent to treatment. You just go straight, you know, can just one, there's sort of one process from involuntarily being detained to being involuntarily treated. Whereas in the Ontario context, um, those are two separate processes. So you can be involuntarily detained, detained and held uh, for a period of time, but you have to be then assessed as to whether or not you can consent to treatment. So it's two separate processes. Um, in, in the Kenyan context, um, it's a, a more of a national, so it's not, it's not regional, it's a national mental health act that's used. And in the Australian context, like Canada, it's, it's based on states. So, so Victoria, where Melbourne, the state of Victoria, Melbourne has its own mental health act, which, and again, they have, they have some similar features. Um, but, but I think what differs the most is the oversight, people's access to rights, et cetera. Um, so yeah, really important. And so we are, we are absolutely taking that into account in each of our sites um, and, and looking at those differences. And, and for example, in BC, there's been a lot of writing um, about the Mental Health Act, a lot of critical writing reports coming out from their ombudsperson, for example. So a lot of that material is referenced in, in the work that we're doing. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple more uh, questions. I just want to say to people, if you have a question, it's helpful to me if you type it into the Q&A, although I do have my um, chat right now as well, if something comes up there. Uh, so uh, the next question is, are there distinct aspects of neoliberalism, biomedical dominance, and colonialism across Canada, Kenya, and Australia that have different effects on the mental health of marginalized groups? So I guess we're looking for distinct yeah, expressions mm -hmm. of these core concepts that might um, manifest differently as your research is proceeding. Great, yeah, great question. And I tried to give a little bit of an example of that in the, in the policy analysis. Um, and yes, absolutely, these things um, are playing out in distinct ways. And one thing that's, that, um, I mean, it's hard to answer this because there's so much, you know, in each of those neoliberalism, biomedical dominance. So, you know, as I was as I was um, talking, I gave the example of um, in the Kenyan context where most people are still accessing um, traditional healers or spiritual leaders for their mental health care. And yet you've got this, um, you know, kind of imposition of a Western biomedical framework. Again, not not that people want to completely dismiss that framework or not use it, but it's kind of interesting. It's as, it's as though the other part of what's actually going on on the ground is not actually happening. 
um, at a policy level. If you just read their their mental health strategy, you'd think, oh, they're just they just use a Western medical model the same way we do in Canada. Um, but if you actually look what's happening, that's in fact not true. Although certainly some people are accessing hospitals and, and are subject to biomedical practices. Um, you know, the with, with, with respect to neoliberalism, um, this is a really interesting question. And I would say that we have not investigated it yet at the level that we need to in the context of, of Kenya and Australia. Um, we've, we've been focused a lot more on um, analyzing that in the policy context in, in Canada, partly personally, because I'm more familiar with the Canadian context, um, but we are gonna see real differential, real, real different ways in which this impacts. Another really interesting aspect of the project, which I think touches on what you're asking, is that um, we've really had to explore um, what does intersectionality mean in each of these contexts, right? So, you know, the part of the reason I brought up the language issue and how people refer to different populations is because when we started thinking about like in the Canadian context, to me, it's obvious, okay, if you're talking about intersectionality, you've got to talk about colonialism, you've got to talk about black populations, you've got to talk about, um, you know, new immigrants, people of color, uh, you know, um, LGBTQ uh, populations, you know, like it, it, it's, it's really clear, right? When you tr try to translate to the, to the Kenyan context, it's very different because you're really talking there more about historical conflicts between different ethnic uh, groups and tribes. Um, and, you know, so our Kenyan team is really helping us to better understand kind of how do we think about that and which populations do we want to bring, for example, into our focus groups who might be having more difficulty um, accessing services there. It's going to be really, really different than in the Canadian uh, or indeed the Australian context. Um, one thing that's true across all sites is that there's very little data collected, even at the level of uh, so in the Canadian context, you know, when you look at um, admissions under the Mental Health Act, you can get sometimes if you push hard, you can get breakdown by by sex. Um, but getting information about ethnicity, um, indigene indigeneity, or um, First Nation status, uh, any other you know social locations, the data just isn't broken down that way. So um, it's not ha wasn't built into our project from the beginning. But we're now talking about partnering with some of the community organizations to develop um, kind of a critique of, but also a data strategy. So what could, in the Canadian context, for example, what could provinces be doing to gather better data so we can better understand the disproportionate impact of these um, practices? Because we know at the, the service level, we know that this is happening. And so, for example, in the Canadian context, uh, in Toronto, the big, uh, you know, the big uh, Center for Addiction and Mental Health Research um, Hospital, they recently released a report uh, showing that um, black patients um, are 44% more likely than white patients to be secluded and restrained, like just as an example of some data that's emerging locally. So hopefully that helped to answer that, that question. There's so much in there and I really appreciate that, that question because it's, it's definitely ongoing. Which is part of the reason why this research project is is so uh, so important and so essential in its interjurisdictional you know approach as well as being centered in these core yeah core questions. So thanks for that. Um, another question, and this was in the text, but now I see it is in our Q and A. I am curious about how MAD studies may fit with this research and the alignment that MAD studies body of knowledge has with this research. Great, excellent question. So, um, so, so for those of you who might not be familiar with MAD studies, I mean, MAD studies really, um, you know, certainly it, it builds on many, many decades of MAD activism. So people who reclaimed the, the, you know, the negative, what's often seen as a negative term MAD, have reclaimed that in a positive way um, and have in many ways um, kind of said, we don't even want to identify ourselves with concepts like mental health because they've been so, so much um, dominated uh, by, you know, particular kind of professional uh, knowledges. So MAD activism and, and MAD scholarship is, is really um, based on uh, gaining knowledges specifically from people with, with lived experience. And also recognizing, I think, um, I know you're not asking for a definition of it, but I thought I would give it anyways, um, and I'll, then I'll answer your question. But but also recognizing that um, that people's experiences of of what what are often referred to through diagnostic labels like schizophrenia or psychosis are not always experienced negatively by people. So that there's a space within 
mad scholarship and mad activism to embrace some of the different ways of being or consciousness, if you like. Um, so having said that, so math studies, I think does play a big role in our project. It's, it's perhaps a silent partner. And I think the reason for that is in part because our work is intended to influence uh, the, you know, the policy domain, influence um, practice and terms like mad are not typically yet uh, adopted in those spaces. Uh, and they don't have the same meaning um, in the Kenyan and Australian context as they do in the Canadian context. Um, however, I would say many of the, the people involved in, on the team and many of the activists involved on the team would, would identify with um, MAD scholarship and MAD activism. So it, I think it does play a role. And certainly one of the ways we're trying to enact it is through, um, and I know we use the term peer because it's, it's a popular term, people understand it. Um, but in our um, team, we have people who identify of having experiences with the system at very many different levels. So it's not just we have peer researchers and then we have other researchers. And many of our high profile uh, researchers have lived experience um, and some of our RAs do, some of them don't. You know, so we, we, we tend not to um, use the labels as a way of, we allow people, I guess, to adopt the labels when it's necessary or when they want to, to foreground their experience. But, I think one of the ways we're speaking to MAD scholarship is, is to have that integration throughout the team so that those knowledges are captured at every level. I have a question for you that follows up on what you're, uh, what you're describing because I'm really interested in the reflexive method that you have described and been so intentional around. Um, and it seems to me, I mean, it's just stating the obvious, I suppose, but there are so many, um, experiences and, and forms of uh, oppression, and in some cases privilege, uh, instantiated in this concept of lived experience, including lived experience of mental health conditions. It just, it embraces so, so much, right? Uh, in terms of relative power to define what that means. Uh, and so what I hear from you in your project is just a, a delightful example of bringing people together and making an effort to be conscious of those power differentials and open up opportunity for folks who are located and identified as researchers and located in very different circumstances to participate together in, as you said, right from the ground up, identifying the values and then doing the research in light of those values. But the question that I wanna ask you goes, takes you back to the challenges around that because um, I think that's such rich, terrain to explore further as, as researchers. And you've already offered some examples of things that you have done in this project to try and open up access to participation in the researcher as an equal, uh, sorry, in the research as an equal. But I just wanted to hear more from you on challenges and ways of overcoming those. So just to, again, set the stage for people, you're talking about multiple jurisdictions uh, and multiple social positions and multiple experiences of mental health crisis sort of episodic or throughout one's life. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I just, uh, I'm, I'm grappling with all of the challenges involved. Maybe there are also linguistic differences. I'm not sure whether, you know, English as the base is potentially an issue. Maybe it's not given, you know, uh, the jurisdictions that you chosen. Um, and specifically, you mentioned Miro boards as something that you used early on. And I'm really interested in how exactly, you know, you can't get into all the deal, but how the conversations were convened using these drawing type um, tools potentially to open up access. And all of that is asked with cognizance of the fact that um, we've seen this tectonic, like amazing shift in research funding to encourage community academic, you know, institute, university institutional collaboration. And we've seen this amazing open, opening up of the idea of co-creation of knowledge, um, which is all so exciting. And, you know, the WHO documentation that you referenced is an example of this and your work is so important. And yet there, it seems to me, there's always this worry on our parts as university-based researchers that we're going to reproduce or create new forms of hierarchy where, you know, in a sense, we're asking people to join on our terms. You, you know what I mean? And so how we counter that is so important. All right, I'll open it up to you. 
Yeah, no, they're fantastic questions. And there's, there's certainly no easy answers with this stuff. I mean, because it starts right at the beginning, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, I mean, ha had been a leader in this when they had, you know, they had um, their what were called Community University Research Alliance grants, which allowed the money for the first time to go to, to the community partner as opposed to the academic partner. Now, this grant is not of that nature. So it starts right there. I mean, who's holding the, the money, right, in the purse string? So it's, 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 you know, the university. And there's so many restrictions on what you can do with that money. Like, so we've had to, so that's just one example. Um, and I don't want to stay with the finances necessarily, but, but it's one example. You have to do a lot of workarounds because, in fact, according to the SHRC rules, they don't want to fund um, investigators in, in other countries, right? They want, the, because, and fair enough, it's our federal go government money. They want to be, they want the money to be going to uh, building capacity for students, for example, in, in the Canadian context. So, so some of that has been really, really tricky, right? Because, because money does um, mean a lot, right? It's resources, right? And it, and it, and it, um, uh, it is a symbol of power, right? So we've, we've, you know, we've, we've worked, I think, well in that context. We figured out ways uh, to transfer funds to other locales to be used um, in ways that make sense in those locales. So that's just one example of, of, you know, one of these sort of more tricky areas. I think where it also comes down is, you know, it's all this. So we do share a language base, so that that is helpful, um, even though it's a colonial language in the context of, of Kenya and also Canada and, and Australia, arguably, um, you know, but we have a, a shared language um, in terms of, uh, you know, the written, but that's not to say in the Kenyan context that it won't become a barrier when we go into the field research, um, because I'm anticipating, especially if we're going to include people outside of large cities, that that language then will, will come up um, and, and probably will come up in all sorts of ways I'm not even aware of yet. Um, so, so I think that will be uh, a challenge. One of the things that we do have on our Canadian team that's helped has been uh, a colleague at UBC who is um, from Kenya and works still in Kenya. So uh, he's been able to be a bit of a bridge to our Kenyan uh, partners there, uh, the community partners there. So be, he's able to go back and forth um, between the two countries and has you know deep knowledge of both so that that helps a lot and I, I would almost recommend that as a almost like a methodology if you've got people that can bridge um, different uh, um, cultural locations etc I think it's really helpful in terms of uh, being able to understand some of the nuances of this stuff um, at a day-to-day -day level I mean some of it is just identifying uh, you're never going to you know, you're never going to be able to equalize the power, right? So I think a lot of it is about identifying and acknowledging um, the power, power differences and, and trying to um, make those things visible in our day-to-day -day work. And so we've done, you know, our, our research assistants, we often, you know, as anybody knows on a research project, it's usually like, you know, the lead researcher and the research assistants that end up, you know, connecting most often, right? And, and having conversations most often. And so I think about that a lot in terms of our team. And we have done some quite intentional reflexive exercises together um, as a way of um, identifying kind of where we are each positioned in the, in the research. Um, but our ability to carry that through consistently, I would say is, is, is always a struggle. It's an ongoing struggle. Um, I'm trying to think of examples that I can give you. I mean, I think some of it, I think, Another thing that's helpful, you know, especially if you're thinking of doing this kind of work is to have relationships that are already built. So although Canada, Australia and Kenya have some interesting overlaps and, you know, they, they ended up being great sites to choose, they were partly chosen because I had been to Australia, I had met with our community partners before I started the, the grant um, development, I, I got people on board in advance, had, you know, had those conversations, I was able to meet our Kenyan partner at a UN event in um, in New York, you know, the year before, uh, where we, you know, we were able to actually sit at a table and talk to each other and see if there were some mutual, um, you know, gains to be made from from them partnering with us on this project. So, um, you know, so that was really, you know, that was pre-pandemic. It was really nice to be able to do some of that upfront work, and I think that's really important so that you're not. Um, you know, just bringing people on that you that you know by name but don't have any kind of real connection to. That said, you know we are you know we are build things are building out, and some of our knowledge users are people I've never met before that I only know through other team members or have come on just because they're interested in the project. So, 
Um, but, but there's a lot of, I, th I think people underestimate like the relationship building piece. And that, that of course is really important and it's hard to do within the constraints of uh, research projects where you know many of us are wearing multiple hats and doing lots of different things. The research is over here, you're teaching, you're doing your service stuff. Um, community-based organizations, you know, often doing this stuff off the side of their desk, have no recognition for it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Students are in it because they want to gain experience, work experience. They might be attaching their own, you know, master's or PhD work to it. So everybody's got a little bit of a different, um, you know, reason they're engaging with it. And, and everybody is really busy and we still have to meet deadlines. And so that can lead to, you know, where you shortcut some of this stuff, right? And I think it's, um, the one, the one gift the pandemic, I guess, has given us um, on this project was the gift of time originally, because everybody, when this project started, we were in the first lockdown. Uh, it's never been so easy in my academic career to convene international, <laughs> you know, uh, partners to get together because nobody was doing anything other than sitting at home, right? So we were able to have these meetings and many of them to kind of build those relationships. So that gift of time at the beginning uh, which allowed us to really, and because we couldn't go into the field research, you know, we could have a lot of conversations about values and and getting, we did a lot of setup work, I would say, um, leading up to the actual research. And and Shirk and as many other funding bodies gave, gave everybody an additional year automatically because they knew people would be slowed down. So that just was like, okay, we can actually do some of this team building and discussions about equity and power in a way that uh, you often don't have the luxury of doing. So that's the silver lining, I would say, of the, the pandemic for us. Marina, um, and I thank you so much for that answer. And I asked you such a loaded question that I, I, I'm really regretting the fact we can't have a workshop on just that, just that question from multiple perspectives with many participants, but we will do that some other day. Yeah. Speaking of the gift of time, uh, we are, we're out of time. I'm so sad about that because I would like this to go on. Um, but I just want to take the opportunity to thank you for this um, just a thought provoking, uh, very uh, rich presentation that you've given us today. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to do something I failed to do at the start in my you know, nervousness and my haste to do the introduction. I did not acknowledge uh, that we are convening this and have convened this presentation uh, on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And that is something that, you know, I say with a tremendous gratitude, but also a sense of tremendous responsibility, you know, heavy hearts in light of the, uh, uh, the evidence that uh, Professor Morrow has discussed about disproportionate course of applications on indigenous and racialized folk, uh, but also with, you know, a sense of hope because of this kind of um, powerful, uh, in a good way, research that, uh, that's going forward. So thank you again, Professor Morrow, for joining us uh, today and sharing this timely, uh, important research with us. And thanks to everyone who has attended. Thanks for the questions that you raised. Uh, and we hope to see you at the next seminar lecture, which is Friday, March 4th, uh, when Claire Horn will speak to her work on justice in the use of novel artificial womb technologies. All right, so thanks again and goodbye. Thank you very much, everyone.